So hello everybody and welcome to another webinar of Danish Sound Cluster. My name is Pedro, uh, as you probably know already if you've seen a few webinars. And uh, today's topic is, is very outside of the box compared to most of the topics we normally have, which are more technology, uh, electronic, related this is uh, more like biology related well biology also has electrical signals but anyway um so uh i'd like to introduce everybody to the hearing restoration topic uh, as the as the the topic says the title says it's it's about the status of of uh, restoring hearing which is a huge topic and and is this is this actually happening? Are we still? Where are we? Uh, where, how is the research, both in humans and animals? So I'll let you guys, um, the the speakers, uh, get into detail. Uh, I'm just here to introduce. So I would like to also start by introducing our our speakers today. Uh, today with uh, with us, you we have. Shalori Amali Nauntoft. Uh, Shalori is a senior scientist at the Met, and she is uh, she's working within hearing therapeutics R and D as a project lead and a scientist on research product broad projects uh, related with cell based uh, therapy for hearing loss. And uh, she'll tell you more about what she's doing. And then we have uh, Jakob Christensen Del Delsge Delsko. Um, he's a, an associate professor at the Institute of Biology, SDU, um, which uh, Jakob is, uh, is an expert in animal hearing, and he's involved in hearing studies of animals such as cormorants, ge geckos, frogs, crocodiles, uh, etc. Uh, welcome, Jakob. And then we have Tommy Mikael Antonin who's a postdoc, postdoc researcher at Institute of Biology, also at SDU. And uh, Tommy uh, is specialized in understanding the cellular mechanisms uh, and effects of noise and, and autotoxins on the mammalian hearing organ that lead to hearing loss and, and much more. So I won't get into much detail. You guys uh, have all the room to talk. So I would just like to, to say that uh, there is a it's a three presentations and then we take the q a at the end and uh, and so please uh, whenever you have a question just go down in the q a button and write your question so that then we can take it at the end and we already have a, a few questions there that would be nice um and and that's more or less it the, the last thing is that we have a survey at the end of the webinar if you'd like to help us with uh, giving some feedback uh, so we can keep improving the webinars. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Charlotte to, to uh, start her share screen and 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 uh, the stage is yours, Charlotte. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Pietro, for that nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to speak today. All right, you see my screen? Yes, all good. Yeah. All good. Yes, so uh, the title of my talk is Medicine for Hearing Loss, what is going on? So as it says, I would like to give you an introduction to this field, uh, what kind of drugs are on the way to treat uh, hearing loss and what, what is really needed to, to, to move this uh, field uh, forward. And as uh, Pedro said, yeah, I'm a senior scientist based at the ex Research Center um, and part of the, the DMA group. Okay. So uh, today, around 10% of uh, the world population has a hearing loss. And by 2050, this is uh, going to increase up to 25%, which correspond to around 700 million that will have a disabling hearing loss. That's many, many people. Um, this is because we are getting older um, and because especially the, the younger generation run around with things uh, in the ear with loud music. We also expose to loud sounds in our environment from traffic, construction work, etc. Then there are also certain uh, types of medicine used to treat uh, 
certain diseases that has side effects uh, can give a hearing loss. And then we cannot get around that genetics also plays uh, a large um, role in, in developing uh, hearing loss. So today, a hearing loss can be remedied by a device. So a hearing aid for mild to moderate hearing losses or a cochlear implant for more severe and profound hearing loss. But what if we could just take a pill and simply throw out the hearing aids out of the window and even cure hearing loss? This would be super cool. And that was what people thought 50 years, 15 years ago or so. But if we look more realistically into the crystal ball, uh, we are going more towards a combination therapy. So in the future, we would likely need some kind of, um, so a drug and a hearing aid device to, to remedy uh, hearing loss. So in the next couple of slides, I will take you through what kind of, um, what type of medicine that are being developed uh, I will give you an idea of what it takes to come from idea to really bringing um, a medical product to, to the market. Then I'll give examples of some of the medicines that are already on the market or on its way. And then finally wrap up what is um, needed, what, what kind of problems is, is, is there still to be solved. Okay. So to set the scene, I'll briefly explain how uh, the ear works for those that do not know. So here is a drawing of uh, the ear uh, and sound waves sets the, the tympanic membrane in motion. And these vibrations are transferred via the middle ear uh, bones to the inner ear. In here, we have hair cells that picks up the, these vibrations and activate the auditory nerve, so the spiral ganglion neurons in yellow. The information is then forwarded to the brain and is understood as sound. Hearing loss is due to various biological mechanisms not working. So the chain can jump uh, off in, in many places. It can be the hair cells that are not working well. It can be the spiral ganglion neurons not working. It can be connection, the connection between them the blood flow, etc. So, so really there's no uh, magic bullet uh, to, to fix uh, hearing loss. The number of companies focusing on therapeutics for the inner ear is growing. And this is particularly due to the major discoveries of the biological mechanisms underlying hearing, hearing loss that's been made over the past year. And I'm sure that Tommy is going to dive um, deeper into. So these companies represented by the, these logos uh, are formed as spin-outs from universities or in co collaboration with uh, pharma. To no, surprise, to no surprise, they are based in Europe and uh, in the US, particularly in Boston, uh, is a hotspot for very entrepreneurial companies uh, pushing the field forward. Also, we have companies on the, the west coast uh, of the US. And last year, uh, the first FDA approved drug um, got on the market for preventing uh, hearing loss. So that was very exciting. And hopefully there is uh, more to come in the next couple of years. So the strategy taken by many of these um, companies fall in four main categories. The first one is auto protection that aims to prevent and protect or protect um, the hearing loss from happening. The next one is gene compensation or gene correction, it's also called, that aim to correct genetic mutations responsible for hearing loss and deafness. The third, uh, the third one is attempts to reduce tinnitus symptoms by modulating activity of the auditory nerve or the central nervous system. A few companies there to, to touch this space because it, it's a very hard and not to, to crack. And then there's also regeneration that aims to regenerate lost or damaged cells in the cochlea. This is attempted by repairing damaged cells with, for instance, growth factors by 
reprogramming um, so-called cochlear support cells in the cochlea into new health cells, for instance, or finally by replacing lost hair cells, hair cells or neurons with stem cells. If we add the, the company logos, you can see that most company for now focus on auto protection. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is likely that the drugs can be repurposed. That means you can take a drug that's been used for another disease, so say to treat epilepsy, and then you try it out for hearing because some of the underlying biological mechanisms uh, might be the same. Another one also being that the patient group here is um, easier to identify and control in clinical trials. The main point with uh, this slide is that the field is very diverse and fragmented. So hearing loss is a genetically and mechanistically diverse condition. There's no one size fit all so indeed, the field is moving towards precision medicine for, uh, for hearing loss, meaning that you take into consideration that the underlying pathology and then you need to match uh, what kind of drug um, fits for this uh, patient. Also, you can see these different strategies and uh, means that companies work in, in, in different spaces. So it's unlikely that one company is, is going to run away with uh, all of it. I would also like to mention that it's not only uh, much cool technology happening in developing these drugs, there's also in, for instance, the, the delivery technology, and we can take Ultramagnetics, which uh, develops targeted uh, drug delivery systems to the inner using magnetism. So they add magnetic particles to a drug uh, put it in the ear and then they place a big magnet on the other side of the ear sort of to steer that the drug gets to the right place uh, in the cochlea. So that's also very cool. The global pipeline consists of uh, various types of um, modalities, you would say. So it's mainly small drug molecules. So the known work horse uh, in pharma you also have gene therapy and cell therapy candidates. Then there are so-called nuclei acids that can be used to modulate uh, expression of certain genes. And then you have biologics, so certain proteins that, that can be used. A key challenge is to get these various therapeutic agents to the right place in the cochlea. So for the small drug uh, molecule delivery, systemic routes uh, or delivery via the, the middle ear has been used uh, in the clinic for some times, for some time. A number of company also use gel formulations to, a pro, to, a, to provide a more sustained release uh, of the drug. In practice, this gel is though a little bit tricky to handle and, and to control. Drug delivery directly into the cochlea offers the best control of delivery, uh, but it also comes with high, highest risk uh, of hearing. Gene and cell therapy are uh, mainly delivered in this way. Finally, cochlear implant-based delivery presents a unique opportunity to administer therapeutics to a subset of patients. The development of medicine takes a lot of time and is very expensive, and it needs to go through uh, highly regulated uh, phases that I'll just go through to give you an, an idea of this. So first, we have the discovery phase where the, the target, the biological target is identified. Then you screen certain compounds and select uh, the drug candidates. Then you move on to either some um, assays before animals, or you go directly into animals, where you demonstrate the, the, the proof of, or you do the, the proof of mechanism that the drug is supposed to do the, the, the right thing, and that it shows efficacy, and that it's safe. You also look a bit into how the drug behaves and interacts in the body, and you make sure that the route of administration is, is good. You can 
highly uh, you can produce the, the drug at high purity, etc. Once you get a green flag uh, for this, you move into uh, clinical trials first in phase one uh, with a few numbers of patients where the main focus is safety. The drug needs to be safe and not uh, do any harm. Then you move on to phase two trial where you look for preliminary efficacy um, uh, signals and also you adjust the, the, the dose and look into how to administer the drug really carefully. And this is in more patients. Uh, after that, you move into the, the larger and way more expensive phase three trial where you really confirm efficacy and safety and sometimes and match it or benchmark it against an, an already existing therapy in a, in a much larger patient group. And it has to, to go through some regulatory um, and procedures before you can launch it uh, on the market. And if we put a, a timeline here, a gen very general timeline, and you can see that it takes up to 15 years from you get the idea to, to you launch it uh, onto the market. Also, I've just added uh, the companies uh, here. You can see that they are in, in various phases of uh, the development uh, and with the different kinds of uh, approaches here. Okay, let's dive into some examples of the drugs that are in development. I will start with auto protection. So last year, there was some good news to the field because the first drug got approved by the FDAs, by the regulatory uh, authorities in the US, and the drug is available for preventing hearing loss. It's a pet mark from Fennec Pharma, and this drug prevents hearing loss induced by a chemotherapy called cisplatin that is used to treat certain childhood, childhood cancers and also adult uh, cancers. And it's known that more than 60% of kids develop an irreversible hearing loss as a side, side effect of this uh, cancer treatment. And they need a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. But a pet mark can reduce this risk by nearly 50%. So that is uh, really great. So for now, it's used, it's approved for uh, many uh, pediatrics in, um, child, or in children up to 18 years which is around 10,000 patients per year. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, Finnick Pharma is working on approving it also for adults, which is uh, up to half a million patients uh, per year that, uh, that they can help. So the key message with this was that the approval of, of, of this drug was really a, an energy booster for the field because it, it demonstrated that it's possible to develop and really bring a, a drug to the market that can help people. Moving on to example number two on gene compensation. So and gene compensation here, you use gene therapy. So what is uh, gene therapy? So a virus can give you COVID, but it can also be used to deliver a genetic material to a cell of interest. And there are a couple of uh, companies uh, working on that. Um, their main lead uh, gene therapy candidate uh, targets deafness caused by mutation in the gene coding for autoferlin. Um, and autoferlin blocks, and this mutation blocks communication between the hair cell and the auditory nerve. So people, so the, um, the patient has a severe or really profound uh, hearing loss. And there's around 20,000 20, uh, patients uh, with this uh, condition. But delivery of normal copy of autoferlin via this gene vector can re-establish the communication between the hair cell and the auditory nerve and those potentially restore hearing. Here I'm showing uh, some data from uh, the company Aquas that have showed that this works in in, in animals that have had this mutation, they put in the gene vector and then they can restore hearing as if the mouse was, had a normal hearing. And they have also shown that it's uh, safe in, in, in larger animals and they can get high expression from this uh, gene uh, vector that they put in. 
So the next step is that um, one of these companies will start a clinical trial in pediatrics uh, this year. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Moving on to regeneration. First, I'll give an example of reprogramming um, uh, support cells into health cells and then replacement of uh, spiral ganglion neurons with stem cells. First on regeneration that uh, Tommy is going to dive a lot more into than I will do here. But here you see an animation of the inner ear here with some cells and with the missing hair cells. And in the cochlea there are uh, cells called progenitor cells, or support cells that have the capacity to be reprogrammed into new hair cells, but they don't do it uh, on their own. So frequency therapeutics is one of the companies that had a drug that could stimulate this process and to make uh, to make new hair cells. So when administered to patients with sudden onset and noise induced hearing loss, this was a mild, uh, this was a moderate to moderate severe hearing loss. It seemed that a couple of patients um, denoted here by the orange dots could better perceive words in quiet. Uh, compared to the placebo group. But please uh, see here that, um, that it was um, a little bit unbalanced uh, with, with the numbers of, of patients. So people got excited, uh, investors got excited, uh, hearing aid manufacturers got a little bit uh, scared because uh, they thought, oh, are we going to run out of business now? Because uh, this is a population of with millions of uh, users. So frequency therapeutics went on with uh, more uh, trials, but in February, they decided to close this uh, hearing regeneration program because of the lack of positive results in uh, the phase two B uh, clinical trials. So they simply um, threw the, this program in, in the trash bin. So of course, this was uh, disappointing and uh, people lost phase faith in, in this field and said, oh, the drugs are not uh, going to work uh, at all. But if you dive a little bit into how frequency therapeutics tested uh, the drugs, um, you might realize that it was a bit of a moonshot. So they simply put in the drug and closed their eyes, uh, at least to me. I was, they did not show um, clear evidence that they had functional engagement of the target. So they did not demonstrate that they could actually regenerate um, functional hair cells in humans. So they did not show any DPOEs or like other kinds of functional measures. Um, also, they had not clear uh, or more refined diagnostics beyond the standard um, tests that you could do. So there was no really or clear stratification of, of, of the patient group and uh, to know whether they even had a well-working uh, support cells, etc. But uh, keep the hopes uh, up because there are um, clinical trial results expected from Audion Therapeutics um, that has a similar strategy. Uh, they will come up with the results uh, soon. Moving on to the last example um, is from Brindry Therapeutics, a UK-based biotech company that aim to replace lost auditory nerve cells or spinal gain neurons with stem cells. And this is relevant for particular patients with cochlear implants that would benefit from having more spiral gain neurons. Brinry have demonstrated that their technology works in a deaf uh, durable animal model. So they have first developed uh, immature spiral gain neurons from stem cells in dish then transplanted these cells directly into the deaf uh, gerbil uh, cochlea where the neurons are normally sitting uh, and their results showed that hearing threshold in these animals were restored up to 40 weeks after transplantation and they also showed that these transplanted neurons could structurally integrate into uh, the issue uh, in, into the tissue uh, as you can see in these uh, nice colorful pictures. So the next step is here that Brindy says that they will start 
clinical trials um, next year. So that's uh, exciting. So the field is, is really moving forward, but there are some clear issues that needs to be solved. Uh, you can also see it a bit, bit uh, as the, the full, that, that the glass is half full, because there's also some cool opportunities for other partners to, to, to buy into to this field. So the first uh, thing is that there's no clear uh, standards of how these clinical trials, there's no golden standards for how these clinical trials should be run. So there's really a need for some clear outcome meshes that can first show that the drug gets to the right place and do what it's supposed to do. And then further down the line that this can translate into a benefit for uh, the patient. This point is tightly linked to a need for a better understanding and a defin uh, and definition of, of the patient group that the drug is, is intended for. So there's a need for very specific di diagnostics. Also, uh, the drug, um, you need a, the, the drug to get to the right place and work in a high enough concentration over um, a certain uh, amount of time. So there's a need for, for really effective delivery approaches um, for, for these drugs. Also, uh, <clears throat> there's a need to have uh, robust uh, preclinical animal models um, that can really be translated into to humans that uh, I think Jakob will, will touch upon. And then finally, um, because this is a high risk game, there are drugs that uh, don't work, that th there are things that has to be closed and et cetera. So there's a need <clears throat> for constantly bringing in new ideas for the trying out a new uh, drug candidates, uh, et cetera. So, so we need to fuel uh, the pipeline. With that, I uh, would like to wrap up and uh, hope that you will take away at least the three key messages. So first one being that hearing is an extremely complex uh, biological mechanism. The, the chain can jump off in, in many ways. That means that we need to tailor a specific kind of medicine for different uh, underlying pathologies and, and different kinds of patients with a specific type of hearing loss. And also, if we look at it in the crystal ball, it's likely going to be a combination therapy. So uh, where hearing loss will be treated with a drug and a form of a device. With that, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking for, uh, forward to some uh, discussions and interesting questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Really exciting. Really exciting. So much to talk about. But before that, oh. we, we will go to, to Jakob which will give another kind of all around, uh, well, you, you'll talk about it, Jacob, but uh, not so human anymore, but still important because it's uh, we're all part of nature and we're all part of the same. I'm just gonna ask you to unmute. And uh, now we can hear you, so. Uh, I don't think that's the first slide, is it? No, it isn't. Why? I can't shift it just this. Oh, here we go. There we go. Can you see my slides now? Yes, it's perfect. <laughs> At first, I should apologize if there's any glitches. I just came back from the field uh, studying frogs out in the Donau Delta, and uh, I'm in Bucharest now in a, in a hotel line, but uh, I hope this will work. <laughs> yes. We'll see if it stalls. <laughs> Maybe so, you just want to speak out a little bit, because I think the okay, microphone is so, a little bit low. So yeah, I'll try to you. be closer to the microphone. Then. Thank you. So Pedro, Pedro, thank you very much for the invitation and the kind words. I've been looking forward to talking about this. Uh, and what I'm, I'm going at in a very different angle, of course, than uh, Charlotte and probably Tommy too, because uh, my basic uh, my basic share of this is is uh, um, uh, fundamental research on hearing in animals, 
Uh, I would like to I would like in this talk to to uh, make you aware how important this research is also for hearing therapy uh, and and how important these considerations are for developing new ideas in the field of hearing. Uh, I would also say that there's another branch of of, uh, of, of this that I won't touch into, and that is uh, development of technological use. This is based on the studies of hearing on animals where um, where, for example, directional microphones based on the ears of flies or, or the robots based on the ears of geckos, which we ourselves have worked on, that, that I will not, will not touch on this here. It would be more related to the medical uses of animals. Um, and with that, uh, let, me, uh, let me state that when we, do, when we do hearing research, there are two fundamental uh, aims of it, so to speak. One thing is to understand how animals and, and, and humans are working, how auditory physiology, how the mechanisms are in auditory physiology. And the other thing is applied medical research. And of course, the more we understand about how the system works, the more will we also be able to modify it and make all these kinds of smart uh, therapeutics that Charlotte was talking about. Uh, and 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 so so a part of it in in is fundamental biological research where we invest, investigate the structure and function of animal ears, their genetics and development, and how they have been shaped by evolutionary history. And that makes possible a lot of studies of of mechanisms that are highly interesting. For example, we can make invasive studies that are not uh, possible in fortunately in our part of the world on humans. We can make genetical studies. We can make direct direct correlations between neurophysiology, how the nervous system works, and be, and the behavior the, or the psychophysics of, of animals that are trained. But we also, as biologists, we also in, uh, should all we always emphasize that evolutionary history is very important. So the 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 time since animal lines diverged, uh, for example. The rodents that most use for, for animal models, they diverged from, from our group of, of uh, mammals and primates about 80 million years ago. That's a long time. It was during the reign of the dinosaurs. Um, and, and another thing is that animal hearing is also shaped by, by what particularly lifestyle they have, and that, 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 that can also modify what they're doing. So, so that we think is important things to bear in mind also when you're using animals as animal models. Um, and and uh, these animal models are, are again two kinds. One is that you use model animals, uh, so-called model animals, which are typically laboratory mice or rats or, or, even, or even gerbils. Um, these have not been selected because they're especially like humans. They're, they're, they've been selected originally in the 100 years ago, because they were easy to breed in numbers, right? Uh, and they are inbred. Uh, they are often inbred strains, which have an advantage. That is that, that uh, they, they are much more, um, experiments are much more reproducible because the animals are almost like siblings, right? Um, and the physiology and genetics is well known of these animals. So, so uh, I'll return to the model animals in a, in a moment. But another, and another approach has been to study animals, um, species that are extremely adapted to one thing through their evolutionary history. And uh, one example is the barn owl uh, at, at left, which is, has been for a long time the model animal of directional hearing. And this is because uh, barn owls, uh, they need to capture uh, uh, animals, they need to, they capture mice, they need to do it by their sounds, the faint rustling sound a mouse makes when it's it's running around on the ground. The mouse has no intention of communicating with the barn owl, this is true. So it would, of course, try to be as silent as possible. The barn owl has to, to capture during the breeding season around 35 mice a night to feed its, its youngs. So this, this, uh, these forces of, of evolution shapes an extreme directional hearing, and, and you, if you look at the physiology, auditory physiology of the barn owl, you'll see adaptations at every single stage of its auditory pathway. So, if you want to study in, in so so to speak, it purely uh, uh, have an animal that is purely adapted for directional hearing, the barn owl is a, a thing. 
the other example is songbirds, and uh, um, uh, Tami also works with songbirds. Uh, so, so I don't know. I don't think you'll talk about those, but but songbirds uh, uh, have to learn their 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 calls. They they learn them when they're young, and and has to perfect them during vocal learning. And of course, you could take this as a as a model of vocal learning also in humans. Uh, nobody assumes that it, it's ex exactly the si same size system, but it can give you some models, some analogs for how uh, vocal learning works, maybe that we can use also in, in, in humans. Um, an example of, uh, of, uh, 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 of, of early studies of animals, uh, animal functions is uh, the function of hair cells. Uh, and uh, much of what we actually know about hair cells comes from studies in fish and in, in, uh, in to a certain extent also in frogs. And that is because in these animals, the hair cells, which are, have generally the same function in, in fish and, and, and reptiles and, and birds and mammals, <coughs> are much, much easier, easily accessible in, in um, in fish and, and reptiles and, and uh, turtles, for example, uh, and, and can be studied. And, and much of our, uh, our knowledge of how this function is, what molecules are involved, how the transduction process works, is coming from these kinds of, uh, of, of animals. So you need not be afraid of doing things that, that is, that's again outside the box, <laughs> outside the, the, lab, <laughs> the model animal box. Mm -hmm. You need not be afraid of, of looking at such studies, they can give you very important insights in the basic function of things. And uh, 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 of course, the current model we have of the uh, how the transduction mechanism actually works, uh, the gated spring model, which describes the transduction in hair cells as little little strings or springs pulling on a, on a cork in the stereocilia. Uh, was developed in in frog uh, frog, frog, frog inner ears by by Howard, Howard and Hotspit, and if there ever is a Nobel Prize in uh, in in this field, I, I would uh, put my money on on Jim Hotspit uh, that he would be one of the guys that get it. So so the transduction mechanism comes from from these kinds of uh, uh, experiments. Um, and and of course uh, genetical studies that can identify the genes uh, is what Charlotte talked about. And they all come from, from uh, studies in, in mice. And that gives possibilities of the gene therapy, therapy thing that Charlotte talked about, uh, although it probably are, are a few years ahead before we actually have it. But um, the, the figure here, uh, the right figure shows you a, a defect, uh, a, a, a mouse with uh, uh, you know, so the, the left figure shows you a mouse with a defective cochlea. It has a gene defect that, that leads to defective um, defective hair cells. And uh, the, the cochlea at the right is repaired using gene technology, uh, using this CRISPR uh, method where you can actually cut off uh, parts of DNA and insert, uh, insert repaired DNA. Um, and you can see that it actually gives some repairment. Again, um, one thing is having the hair cells there, and one thing one thing is this that Charlotte very correctly said is to make the right correct connections, and you can cannot see it from here, but you can at least get one one step of the way by these kinds of technologies, and these are based on what we know about how the cochlea works, and cochlear function. Uh, was originally based on on the studies of human temporal bones uh, and studies in 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 uh, uh, pigs too, and by doing so, uh, von Bekesi with the apparatus you see at the left uh, was able to directly stimulate the uh, parts of the cochlea and observe the vibration of it, and that showed that the the uh, the, the um, frequency were analyzed by the cochlea using a, a kind of a place principle where, where uh, low frequencies would excite the, the innermost part, the apex of the cochlea, high frequencies, the outermost part. Uh, so, so this was based on, uh, originally on human experiments. But then uh, when you turn to live animals, 
uh, it turned out that it looked quite different. And if you have a live animal, uh, how do I point here, by the way? Is it, uh, uh, can I get a pointer out? And see, is that this one? Uh, can you see my mouse pointer right. now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I would rather have a dot, but I can't see how I get that. Uh, anyway, this is good enough. Um, so, um, oh, come on, I need to go back. Yeah, we uh, can see your pencil. I want to go back. <laughs> Sorry. I think there's an, an animation in this slide. Maybe that's why it's a bit slow. No, I don't think there's an. Oh, here you go. Okay. And I do I have the pencil now? No, I don't have it. <laughs> it's all good. Okay. So, um, if you measure from a live animal and measure the 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 vi actual vibrations of the basilar membrane, uh, if you do it in a live animal, you see uh, curves that are much different from from Bekesi, what from Bekesi found. But what he found was was vibration curves that would look like this uh, uh, at, at one certain particular point of the of the basal membrane membrane you would get this rather uh, shallow and, and rather unfocused peak of, of vibrations but if you look at a live animal you you get a, 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 a much sharper peak and again uh, these animal experiments were, were, were very important to to uh, to show this and if you go to if you go to I can't shift this slide. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, these animal experiments were were extremely uh, difficult to do. So you had to, you you have to have a live animal. You have to to um, to make a, an opening so you can actually shine, a, for example, a laser focus on the basilar membrane in an intact uh, live cochlea. And by doing so, you can show this very sharp response, which has led to. Uh, to our theory of the cochlear amplifier and the active amplification of the vibrations of the cochlea. This was not possible to see in the in the from BXC experiment. And this shows you that you have these active responses, you have you the compression. So if you if you stimulate a, a, a cochlea at at uh, at, at um, different different uh, sound levels, uh, uh, as you can see in the, the figure A. You will get uh, at, at low sound levels. You will get a very focused response. At higher sound levels, you get a very unfocused, broader response. Which is, and 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 also the gain of that uh, at the, of, of the basilar membrane motion will decrease. Uh, so you so you 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 get you can measure in this way the figure uh, that what we call compression in the in the cochlea, which of course has been crucially important for the modern designs of. Uh, of hearing aids, uh, this notion of the uh, of the cochlear amplifier, and which is also we know, now know is what what goes wrong during uh, during intense in, during most intense noise exposure by damage of the outer hair cells, and if you create a tuning curve from this figure A uh, uh, by by assuming a certain vibration for for the threshold, you can get tuning curves that very much like look like what you measure. From the auditory, uh, from the auditory nerve. Uh, Jakob, can I just ask yeah. you what is the signal that has been used for these measurements before? Uh, the so you have different uh, levels, but of what? Yeah, uh, well, it's it's just sound stimulation. So so you you stimulate. Uh, you have a frequency axis. Here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you have a frequency axis here, so you stimulate stimulate that sound at different frequencies. But you okay, it's just pure tones. From, from pure tones, but you record from a certain place. Which corresponds to the uh, to the frequency of ten kilohertz. I mean that's where it has its maximum sensitivity. But okay. but 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 you you stimulate it all along. So you can see that at higher levels it would be much more much the response is much more unfocused. You have a vibration response at, at a larger at, at, at a larger frequency range. Um, then. Uh, an interesting thing that was found recently, and and which is 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 slightly controversial uh, now, is that if you if you now uh, if you stimulate the cochlea with noise, uh, uh, you will see what is called a temporary threshold shift. Um, if you 
uh, and it's temporary because if you if you measure some time after this exposure, uh, the the um, the the autogram will return to normal, right? Um, but the problem is that uh, Kuyava and Lieberman could show in rodents, so mice, guinea pigs, uh, gerbils too, I believe. They could show that that uh, you 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 may get an a, a, a normal audiogram, but if you if you look at the nerve loss, you will see that that up to fifty percent of the afferent nerve fibers can have been lost. So you only need you'll get an, a normal audiogram if you just have a few of the most sensitive uh, nerve fibers present. But but actually, since you have 16 or 20 afferent nerve fibers from going to each inner hair cells, you can have lost a, quite a lot of those. Uh, and, and that is what they showed in, the, in mice. And their conclusion uh, is that temporary threshold shift can no longer be considered safe. If this was true, if, if we believe this for humans, then all noise standards would, will have to be revised. So there's a, there's there's still a controversy whether these uh, animal experiments actually can be extrapolated to humans, and many groups are working on uh, with conflicting results, I should say, in showing in in uh, on, uh, trying to understand whether we see similarities in in uh, in in humans. If we don't, this is one of the examples where the animal models do not work, because the results are clear in the rodents uh, studied so far. Um, and that brings me to some of the problems interpreting results using model, anima, model animals. <clears throat> and one thing is uh, that in order to do most of these experiments, you have to work with anesthetized animals. Um, and uh, anesthesia has different effects. They can, uh, and, and, and there can be differences in susceptibility to anesthesia for, for animals that can, can uh, uh, somehow could, could um, influence the results. The other thing is that, as I said before, we are working with laboratory strains uh, and uh, these uh, strains are normally inbred and, and inbreeding, uh, which makes them so, so wonderfully alike and, and, uh, and reproducible and so on, of course, could produce no, some effects that you don't want. They can uh, they can produce uh, some ki different kinds of defects. For example, most of these animals are albinos, right? And uh, who knows whether there are any effects of inbreeding on the auditory physiology. Uh, the other thing is that when you select animals, uh, when you breed animals, uh, even though you don't think about it, you of course make a selection. You you typically would take the animals that are easiest to handle. That is the stupidest ones. You will typically take the animals that are less disturbed by the lab environment. That is the deafest ones, and and there will be other things that the de that that uh, uh, that you will select without knowing it will select them for. Then of course there could be biological differences between especially rodents and and us primates. I mean as I said they they uh, they um, we diverged about eighty million years ago. And then there's a problem of age-related hearing loss, with, which I will uh, return to in, 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 in a moment. But just to show you the effects of, of inbreeding, uh, here are laboratory strains of ra rats and mice uh, 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 compared uh, of, of rats, the three, three um, lab strains of rats. Um, uh, and each audiogram, there, there are two audiograms in each of these figures. And the lower one in all cases is measured on wild rats. So we were able to obtain the wild rats from the Pest Control Institute in Copenhagen. Uh, they are not the nice cuddly animals you work with in the laboratory. They are handled by thongs and kept in, in iron cages so because they will get their way out. Uh, and they all have better hearing than the, lab, the three lab strains we studied. So these are the, the uh, if you're interested in the types, they, they are the Wista rats, uh, the uh, the Fisher rats and the Spragdorni rats are the, the three autograms you see here. There are other strains I should uh, say that have better hearing than, than these laboratory strains. For example, uh, the hooded rats, but it's something to take into account when you, when you do hearing experiments. Right? 
Um, so so the, there are uh, at least uh, generally up to 10, maybe more uh, dB difference across frequency. And I think it's because that the selection procedure you do when you do make these strains uh, is that you generally select them, those that are not disturbed in the lab, lab environment. So it's a typical response of the mice and rats to kill their, their offspring if they, if they are stressed by intense noises. And these animals are the ones that survive in a lab in, uh, environment. Can I just ask you something? Could it yeah. even be that these rats are actually less disturbed because they hear less? Yeah, of course. I mean, they, <laughs> that's, a, that's a thought. I mean, they, yeah. they're the ones that survive, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and they, they're the ones that would be selected in such an environment. Exactly. Um, then there's the age-related hearing loss. And, and uh, it, of course, if, if you have an old mice, an old mouse or an old rat, then it, it would be about a year, a half a year or, or up to two years. They, they usually die before they're two years old. Um, and uh, so, so this, the, the problem is that when you, when you look at old mice and old rats, can you then really, can you really then extrapolate to old humans? You, you wouldn't be able to do that if, if you think that what, what uh, uh, what degrades our hearing is mechanical mechanical uh, uh, wear of the cochlea, because because an, an old human must have, must have had much more much more uh, noise exposure if you sum it up over seventy years than an old mouse has. Uh, so even though you find some similarities between old mice and old uh, old humans, I would think you should take. It, with a grain of caution, with, whether this is actually the same, the same kind of thing. So I will wrap up here, and I'll uh, uh, conclude this somewhat rambling notes on, on animal auditory physiology with that. That first, first of all, what we know about auditory physiology is based on animal experiments in a wide group of animals, ranging from from fish to uh, to mammals, of course. Um, and, and of course, when you, when you use these experiments uh, in translation, translational or medicine approaches, you should note that, that you, you should interpret everything with care <laughs> and, and for, uh, in, at best ask a biologist. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, there would, would be this biological difference between animals and humans. And if you wanted to be safe, I think the safest approach would be that you don't, um, that you don't always restrict yourself to the known animal models or mice and rats and gerbils, but but try to go outside that box and 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 look at at, at uh, different different kind of of animals. Uh, and remember that the the model animals are, are they weren't selected for anything that has had to do with humans. They they were selected because they were easy to breed. And by that I'll end. Thanks for your attendance. Fantastic. Thanks, Jacob. All right. Well, uh, let's just uh, keep pushing. And uh, Tommy, you can uh, go ahead. I'm just going to highlight you here. And uh, and then we'll take the Q&A at the end. And uh, off you go. Thank hey, you. Thanks for the opportunity to present here. And it's nice to follow up from the good presentations before me. So they went through all the hard stuff so I can go into rehearsal regeneration then. So what I wanted today talk to you uh, uh, about is how much we have learned from these uh, different animal models, what kind of failures we have had lately. Uh, well, of course, nothing is a complete failure. We always learn something important, but, uh, but results have not been what we have been expecting. And what are the future challenges that that uh, hair cell regeneration field has currently? So, um, basically, hair cell regeneration and finding of it is, is a success story of comparative studies into hearing. And it is just because uh, researchers were brave enough to look into animal models that are normally not used that much. And, and, and as you can see in these figures here now, if we look at publications on, on auditory research on on different animals and the grant funding from NIH, 
Well, we can see that around 2005, my studies are booming. So that's where what everybody is doing now. And then Jakob touched a bit what is the problem there. So, so what I just want to highlight here that we, we should maybe consider going back a bit more into comparative studies in, in, in other animals too, because we can learn a lot. So what can we learn? Um, so if we start on our path to the discovery of hair cell regeneration, maybe the first findings indicating that something like this can happen came from fish. And uh, fish have a, a structure called lateral line. Uh, and it's a line on their side, and it's it, it, there's many spots where they have hair cells. So these mechanosensory cells that get stimulated if something vibrates. Uh, and uh, fish use this to sense the movement of water next to them and, and orienting themselves in the water. And, and it was in, in already in 1933 and around 47 when people started to see that, hey, if we amputate a small part of the tail bud of this uh, fish uh, and the tail bud grows back, so does these uh, neuromasts where we have these hair cells. So this was an indication that, okay, maybe invertebrates, hair cells could regenerate. And later on, similar uh, results were found in amphibian ears that maybe also in the inner ear, hair cells could be um, added on. Um, Maybe one special paper that I would like to mention in is work by Jeffrey Corvan from 1974. So he was studying sharks. So again, not the most traditional model to look at. Uh, and he uh, discovered that the, uh, the, uh, the um, sensory epithelium where hair cells are in the inner ear of sharks, that keeps growing for the whole, whole lives. So basically hundreds of thousands of new hair cells are added into the shark inner ear throughout their life. And that was quite exciting to everybody that, okay, hair cells can be made also after an animal is born. Uh, and similar morpholog morphological observations supported this in other fish and, and, and other amphibian models too. So in the left picture, you can see these white dot-like things. Those are those hair cells. And if you go in the left picture further and further, you can see that Somehow the white dots are smaller and smaller. So those are the hairs of the hair cells. And you can see the small ones are just uh, freshly added hair cells on the corner, corner of the sensory epithelium. Okay, um, something big happened around uh, 86, 87, especially in the meeting of, of the Association of Research in Otolaryngology, maybe one of the biggest meetings in our field. Douglas Cotan showed some beautiful EM pictures that and that that he had taken from um, uh, the chicken inner ear that was damaged by sound, and this was amazing to many people because this was the first direct evidence that wow, actually after sound damage to the ear, hair cells can regrow back in some animals. So on the left picture, you can see a normal chicken Bacillus papilla. That's the one that they use for hearing. And those dots there are single hair cells. So then um, uh, Kotans gave them a lot of noise trauma. And uh, this picture in the middle is a traumatized uh, um, uh, epithelium of hearing. And you can see that there starts to be areas where the hair cells look very funny and they are missing. So they are basically dead. But amazingly, 10 days after trauma, in those areas that were previously devoid of hair cells, you can start to see something uh, small hair cells popping out. And indeed, here's a magnification of those areas. Those are new hair cells growing. And, and of course, the question is, where do these come from? Uh, and Kotans already mentioned in that paper that maybe it is the neighboring cells, so the supporting cells. And um, this made a huge boom in our field. And we finally recognized that hair cell regeneration might be possible if we understand how it takes place. And the next uh, important paper that I want to highlight is for, by Corvan and Kotanj, and then a different lab, Riles and Rubel, that both almost at the same time showed that it, indeed it's so those supporting cells and next to the hair cells that produce this. How did they do that? So back then they just uh, injected those animals with uh, radioactive compounds 
and those compounds go into the cells that are dividing. And on the top picture, that's basically a picture where we can see uh, micro audio radiographic uh, labeling. So yeah, each dot uh, indicates that that area was radioactive. And we can see that the supporting cells, uh, those lower dots there have those dots, but also those new hair cells on top of the epithelium have those dots. So basically that was a, already an indication that supporting cells produce new hair cells. Now, So now people knew the right cell type. And uh, so basically what happens, there's two ways that this can take place. So the hair cells here in purple die away and the supporting cells around them sense this somehow. And in some cases, the supporting cell uh, first di divides and makes more cells and then slowly transforms into an hair cell, like in the uh, first picture A. And in some cases, uh, there's no proliferation. So the cells do not divide, but they directly turn into a different cell type. And this is called direct transdifferentiation. Both ways take place. Uh, depends a bit on the animal model, which is the most important way. So in chicken, it's mainly, uh, mainly proliferation. So the uh, supporting cells do divide. While we go into zebrafish, we see more of a direct transdifferentiation. And un unfortunately, in mammals, we do not have this. And, and of course, the multi-million dollar question is, why does mammals lack this amazing gift? And, and so if we just look at the pathway of, of what has historically happened, of course, in 1978, we, we all know cochlear implants back then, still the most viable way of giving hearing back to some patients. But that, after that one year, uh, that was when hair cell regeneration was found. And now you have seen also the pictures that people con got convinced about it. Maybe the next big step was when uh, gene therapy uh, ways were used in guinea pigs and something called 801 was put in supporting cells and suddenly they have new hair cells. And of course, this, everybody was super excited about this. So we went th uh, forward with this compound called 801, and it was now put in clinical trials that we can talk about later more. But where did this 801 uh, information come from? That came from decades of work on, into the developmental biology of the inner ear. So here is one, just one picture of different molecular players inside the cell that direct hair cells becoming hair cells. And you might see on the, like next to the DNA piece there on the bottom of the picture there, it says 801. So everything kind of comes to 801. So that's really the master regulator of hair cell fate. So like I said, this is decades of uh, developmental biology work into understanding how a small piece of ectoderm in the embryo uh, move, com, makes this complex inner ear that we have inside our in, in, head and how the hair cells are formed. So decades of work, very complex understanding and, and many molecular uh, players. Anyway, if we take that cloud of developmental biology information that we have, and let's take a small piece of it. So what the 801 that I mentioned does during development is that one cell decides that I will be a hair cell and it starts to express 801 uh, inside it. And this will uh, tell the cells around it, you guys can't be a hair cell because I'm a hair cell. So what happens is uh, in, like in this picture here, you can see this uh, blue dot is a cell that decided to be a hair cell. Then it tells the cells around it, you guys, you are supporting cells. And then this continues and as a wave in the inner ear, so you can get this grainy pattern of hair cells and supporting cells next to each other. And um, basically, uh, this is what people try to do. So they will force the cell to express 801 and they try to force it to think that it has to be a hair cell. Another approach that uh, companies are, are trying now is stopping the cells from telling the other cells next to them that you can't be hair cells. So basically then everybody can be a hair cell if they want to be. But that's it basically what that is. And uh, as I said, uh, researchers were able to get new hair cells in, in research animals in this way. But something that was not taken into account 
very much is that this is very limited to young animals. So this works really well in animals that are a few weeks old. But when researchers try this in adult animals, 801 alone is not that potent anymore. And that might be also one reason why this 801 clinical trial was not as success, uh, successive, uh, successful as we wanted. Uh, and it just means that we need to do something else. And people are uh, moving forward. We are trying other things. So you, you saw the cloud of molecules that we can try. What different companies and researchers are now trying hey, maybe it's 801 plus something else. So we are trying different cocktails uh, of molecules to put into the inner ear, into the supporting cells, and hoping that they turn into hair cells. And in some cases, they do. Uh, uh, so this is just a cloud. Uh, for example, if we look at this paper, they just decided to take 801 and GFI1 and try, maybe those guys would uh, be enough. And indeed, they do get hair cells uh, in, in experimental animals generated. So, uh, but uh, unfortunately, in many cases, the hair cells that we can nowadays generate, they do look like hair cells. They electrophysiologically behave a bit like hair cells, but they are really not fully hair cells. So, so they are a bit like immature hair cells at the moment. So on the picture on the left, you can see in purple hair cells and the hair bundles from top, that's how they should be. And in, for example, in this 801 GFI paper, you can see on the right picture, these white plebs, these weird hairy like things. So yeah, they do have hairs, hair cells and they're kind of in the right place, but not, all, not everything is correct. So we are really going towards the right direction, but we do need more information on how to guide these cells to be real hair cells. And a small problem or a big problem is that these uh, regenerated hair cells, in some cases, they don't survive very long in the inner ear. So they tend to die quite quickly. So we need also methods to support that these cells would stay in the inner ear. This is a different example of those weird hairy, hairy cells that you can see on the bottom of the pictures that, yeah, we are really not there yet, as you can see already from the morphology. Um, let's skip that. So what do we need? Uh, uh, I, I really think that we need more information from these uh, uh, non-mammalian models where hair cell regeneration happens. So what, what, for example, researchers are currently doing is that they are taking, taking individual cells from the chicken uh, inner ear. They are trying to trace by cell by cell how they change from a hair cell to a supporting cell and look at uh, on single cell RNA sec level what genes and what molecules are in those cells expressed exactly on those points. So it is in the end it will be a massive map on how a hair cell sorry a supporting cell turns into a hair cell and we do need more information in this way. So in a way I would say we jumped into mouse and human clinical trials quite quickly, but I would still say that maybe now after some decades, maybe we should so go even more back into the, where we started in, 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 the, in the 80s. Uh, lastly, I want to say, and this is also where my interest is at the moment, we also need to understand better how good this regenerated hearing is. So on the left picture, that, that's a picture from a songbird inner ear after one month, and those are regenerated hair cells. And for hair cell function, they should be oriented perfectly. So all of them should be oriented in a similar fashion. And as you can see in this picture, some of the regenerated cells, yeah, they, are, they look like hair cells here. That's great. But they are a bit misaligned, right? Uh, so already this means that when these cells are stimulated, some of them are stimulated not exactly in the right way. And this, for example, could explain in, in some songbirds why their hearing is not regenerated naturally completely. So we get almost close to normal hearing thresholds, which is great, uh, but not there, uh, not completely to normal hearing thresholds. And as, as you all know, normal hearing is much more than normal hearing thresholds, right? So we also need to understand how well does regenerated hearing support vocal learning, for example. And that's what we are uh, 
together, for example, with Jakob and, and, and Professor Kuhn Elemans, what we are working now is in, uh, we looked at this in C provinces. So uh, we are looking at how good a regenerated hearing is in, in template learning so in these animals. So, so the juvenile males listen to their father singing and learn, learn how to sing from this model. And, and this gives an interesting opportunity for us to understand okay, but how about if they have a regenerated hearing? Can they do that song learning as well? And, and also the song performance, is it also as good with regenerated hearing? Why do we need this answer? If it's not that good, so maybe we just should go and continue developing cochlear implants, right? Well, maybe maybe not, maybe the regenerated hearing one day will be much better, but this, this, this is just some of the directions where we should go. So thanks for your time. Amazing. Thank you, Tommy. That was really interesting. All of yours, all of you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, there's already some questions and I love how you guys explored so many different things, but it all comes together in the end. So that was really great. Um, let's check the questions we have here. So the first question is from Preben Christ, and it's, uh, are there any auto protection medicines targeting noise and or age related hearing loss? I guess that one is for Charlotte maybe to begin with. Yeah, yeah, I can take that one. So, um, so there has been some tested out uh, with like where you say noise, so it's more like, um, like uh, in military services. So there's been some uh, studies conducted in the military for soldiers that has been exposed to very loud sounds. Um, and that type of drug is sort of, um, it's called an anti-inflammatory drug or they can sort of reduce this, the stress that has been uh, induced, but there was no really clear sickness in that. Um, yeah, but uh, but people are, looking into that so so it's also again like how you model it if it's uh, also this um, the, that Jakob mentioned that is also a little bit linked to the age related to the sonotopathy so the Lieberman studies where you see that that the neurons is is detaching from the hair cells that quite some uh, some work going into trying to regrow the 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 terminal of the auditory nerve to to connect um, on that, um, adding some, it, it, this is mainly growth factors. Um, so yeah, there are there, there work uh, onto that. But just uh, commenting on that, there's one company, uh, Autonomy, that recently um, had to uh, dissolve the, the company and one of their drugs was this uh, growth factor that aimed for growing out uh, the, 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 the auditory nerve terminal and their they did not see any positive results in the clinical trials, so they ran out of money off and had to close. That does not mean that it's not a way to go, but as we have learned that there are many other issues to, to solve. But with which kinds? Was it was it gene therapy? Was it something else? Which kinds? So so this with a, a, a protein based for, okay. uh, for for the sonotopathy, and then it's small drug molecules for this more like uh, acute vitamin pill for. Um, loud noise exposure yeah in animal models like the like giving these nerve growth factors uh, it has been shown that the nerves do grow back to the hair cells so yeah. it, it does work there but of course taking that information into humans it, it will be a challenge and of course there's many pitfalls there so, but also already in the animal models we do see uh, a, a bit something where we have to uh, think more is that we see that the nerve fibers sometimes grow a bit into weird places if the nerve growth factors are not given directly into the right spot. Mm -hmm. So maybe into just looking into drug delivery in that case would yeah. help. And and yeah. there is also some some good results in auto protection in, in animal models too. Uh, unfortunately, these these drugs are often uh, not nice otherwise, so they have side effects. So I would be careful mm -hmm. in many cases. There. So there is hearing protection, but you might lose something else. So it's yeah. not always nice. And um, lastly, uh, on hearing uh, like protection from noise, uh, the best one is just to protect your ears, really. Yeah. 
so um otherwise you are take and it's it's hard so basically we would need that protection just when the noise is happening mostly mm. uh, or just directly after it so we need a pill that has to be popped in just in a couple of hours after you feel that ah something is a bit wrong but protecting uh, after many days that will be a challenge mm. well, that that pill is called earplug i guess but uh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's still the best one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And can I just ask so so this with the the nerve growing back, it's also point of yeah, what what, what Tommy said, yeah, that you we can region or generate some new hair cells, but it, it still requires a connection from the auditor nerve to these new uh hair cells, right? So you cannot just have the hair cells, but they need to functionally uh, reconnect. Uh, yeah, that's a big challenge and and what is cool about that 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 whole thing happens in chickens for example so we really need to go back there and understand how does that happen mm. but, but and, if i may add something then um, the the chicken um, uh, papilla is, is is much simpler in in a way than the mammalian cochlea because you have the hair cells freestanding the most of the tuning is electrical tuning right so an, an intrinsic property of the hair cell so, so there's a maybe that's why the, the the mammals don't regenerate because it's it's too mechanically complicated. I, I think you have something right there. So one yeah. big hypothesis in the field is now that these supporting cells that us mammals have they tend to be very complex in shape and they have very rigid structures. For example, they have a lot of these kind of tight junctions to each other. So a way how cells stick to together and they are super strong. So one idea is that they are, they might be just too rigid to turn into hair cells. And also that's also what, what we researchers are looking into. Like, can we make the supporting cells a bit more plastic and then they could pro provide us with new hair cells. So indeed, uh, I would say maybe the mammalian inner ear is a, a too fancy car and you can't anymore change the lamp anymore. But in an old car, you can change the front lamps easily, right? So it might be a bit of a problem like that. So we have two fancy cars. Yeah. Can can I ask, or, or maybe you, you went into that, Jakob, um, a bit. So, so is, is there no membrane on top of the hair cells in like in chicken or in, in superfish? Uh, I think there's a membrane. Uh, covering the hair cells, but it's not. Uh, but the, but again, the main uh, a large part of the frequency analysis is done uh, by electrical resonance in in uh, in, in birds. Uh, I can see that there's a question from Tom, from Thomas, which is sort of onto this: uh, whether we know if animals have outer hair cells. Um, and it's interesting that. That particular structure of the, is, is a mammalian structure with the three outer hair cell rows of outer hair cells and a, a row of inner hair cells. But in, interestingly enough, the same mechanism is found almost in all in all ears, including insect ears, that you have active processes that that generate some kind of amplification. So in the uh, there are analogs in the animal models, if if not homologs. Yeah, we do have something similar in chickens. So we have usually yeah. two different main types, and and especially the outer hair cells are usually the type two. Yeah. Uh, to the question of the membrane on top of the chicken chicken um, sensory epithelium, there is that one, mm -hmm. uh, and something that is also very interesting is that when chicken hair cells regenerate, they have to regenerate that structure too. So actually supporting cells again play an important role. They make a new layer of, on top of the sensory epithelium. So each time they can actually produce a new one, which is amazing. Well, um, about the chicken, um, you had three pictures. I think it was Jakob who had the three pictures of the of the chicken. And, and you had the control and then you had the regenerated but they look quite different. Is, was the control the same chicken or another chicken? Or I think another that was Tommy. I yeah, that was my, so, the, oh, yeah, so sorry. the control looks a bit different. So those are uh, specific time points after, after the no, uh, noise trauma and, and before that. So those are different animals. Yes. So the differences in the pictures are just maybe um, 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 a bit on the direction how it has been uh, imaged. But the main thing that you see in those pictures was that these uh, hair cell-like appendages or those white things were 
present yeah. in the first one and in the other ones it was clearly missing and then they suddenly reappear again but mm. in, in a very small format yeah no definitely there was a lot more symmetry between the two control and regenerated but that the overall structure look look quite different so that's why i was yeah curious oh we have another question now. let's check it out thomas again perhaps the different active mechanisms were developed at another time in evolution this goes to Jacob, I would say, right? Uh, yeah, they, they, that's true. I mean, uh, insects, uh, the insect ears are, are diverged at a different time than ours. So, so that's that's uh, that's what we call we biologists call, call convergent evolution. So, different solutions to the same of the same problem, so to speak, which is to generate a, a, a more to gener generate some kind of amplification of the of the auditory response. But that kind of amplification you can find in 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 almost all animal groups that have ears. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have some questions to each other? You are very welcome to, if you have some, to keep it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um. Otherwise, I'll just keep going because. Or I, or I just maybe have have a comment on this, like. Um, Again, translating it, 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 it into human because there are so you cannot just put the like the ATO uh, H1 in because that the, there needs to be supporting cell in the human cochlea. And for now, we don't understand much about these supporting cells. What kind of hearing loss is there? So there are some some uh, nice work, or I, I know of uh, Charles Lieberman that is looking in in some temporal bones and trying to figure out okay. The age-related hearing loss. Are there at all any supporting cells left? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. And then, so, so it's also again like to narrow down the the patient groups and to better is, link. Is yeah. the supporting cell and the progenitor cell the same thing? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Some of the support cells are progenitor cells. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because yes. uh, you you were talking about this progenitor before, and that was uh, really interesting because. Uh, and then he said the frequency therapeutics and audion is also autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, autonomy. yeah, yeah, audion, yeah, yeah, audion. Audion. and then some other, uh, yeah, there's been some other companies okay. as well. So, so yeah, that, that, that's very... yeah. Please continue. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, you go ahead. I don't. Think yeah, I just wanted to comment that you're completely right that. It's a challenge to know what uh, supporting cells are left in the patient's ear, and that will develop depend a lot on, on what kind of trauma there has been. So mm -hmm. for, for from temporal bone studies, we do know that after some uh, major trauma, there might not might not be any supporting cells mm -hmm. left there anymore. So also this will be more of a challenge in that sense, uh, or we need to develop ways to also see into the patient's ear and understand what we have there left that we can work with. Yeah, you're yeah. completely right. That's That's one point. I think I would like to ask a question to both of you, Tommy and Charlotte, and that is how many years do you think <laughs> realistically before this will work? On on the regeneration, you mean, or like in general? Yeah, like, or, uh... yeah or, 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 or the, some of these therapeutics you were talking about uh, no. before they Sorry. really would. Because, uh, yeah, or I can see, so, so especially there's been a lot going on in the cochlear implant field as well for a number of years where you try to coat the electrode with some kind of drugs, right? So both where you like, first simple way that, that you add some in inflammatory drugs and not to do much harm that is just caused right from, from, from the surgery, but also to add some growth factors for the, um, for the um, uh, peripheral accent to, mm. to grow out. Uh, but I think those that so 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 the regenerative approaches are like a bit further ahead. I, I think there where you have the autoprotective drugs, because there again you have a clearly defined target. Yeah, and we need to prevent this antibiotics. This we need to block this ion channel in this these types of hair, hair cells in this type of patients that in two hours will give the treatment. So so the, it, it's a lot more defined from like from the pharmacological or biological perspective, but also from the clinical point of view that you already know, okay, it's these patients. 
That's yeah, I mean, in a way, bone conduction is a success story that is hard to beat, right? I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's really simple in a way. I mean, I know it's, the techniques and the technology is yeah. not simple, but, but I mean, the, conceptually, it's, it's fairly simple, right? And it just yeah. works. But, but but also for gene therapy, so so there are a number of gene therapies approved already for like blindness, where you can add a genetic vector that that encodes a healthy protein, uh, or a, a normal uh, a normal copy of of the protein. A couple that are worked, and so people can go from completely blind to see contrast and 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 etc. So I think that the, the technology around the gene therapy is uh, is is really moving on fast. So. I I'm quite optimistic about these monogenetic uh, disorders that, that something is going to happen at least. Yeah. Uh, but, but... Yeah. Great. Uh, so there is one question here we can... T oh, it was just a thank you. Uh, uh, not, a, not a question. Um, what, uh, uh, Jakob, I didn't really hear your last comment. You said what was, what was uh, simple and efficient? Uh, Cochlear um, implants. Ah, okay. All right. I, yeah. I thought I, I heard bone conduction, but <laughs> yeah, no, no. It, no. I, okay. I, I, it might, I might have said bone conduction. I meant it's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I was also thinking about that. And and it's good that you said, Charlotte, that there was uh, already some uh, coating, as you said, right? Uh, and I was also thinking about the kind of periodicity you have in inside the cochlea, right? And maybe that's also important to have some kind of periodicity in the drug administration. I don't know, because otherwise you get into this uh, random hair growth that uh, Tommy was showing, and then it's yeah. a chaos yeah. inside. So, so they 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 will grow out, but it's a matter of, yep. Uh, but, but it's also, again, are, are they still functioning? Like they grow out, we can see that they're there, but do they work as intended? Like yeah. we, we really don't know. Yeah. yeah. And also to get it uh, like, quite stable uh, uh, like in patients as well we don't know like in half year are they just going to degenerate as tommy said that these regenerated hair cells are not as robust as mm. Mm. maybe something that will be interesting and i think in in the near future is uh again with cochlear implants but let's let's leave the electrical stimulation behind and um, we are moving towards optogenetics also mm -hmm. there so Mm -hmm. uh, with with LED lights inside the inner ear, we can stimulate mm -hmm. with light much easier. And again, then it means gene therapy, but we can make the spiral ganglion neurons light sensitive. So instead of, let's say, about from the 10 channels that what you can have, or even more in the cochlear implants, we could move towards much more channels. And I think that's okay. also something where we potentially will see something cool in a couple of years. Like a fiber optic kind of thing or what? Indeed. So this yeah. is developed a lot, for example, in Germany. So so I expect to see something very cool linked to optogenetics. But do you think you have enough stimulation with light as you have with electricity? Uh, uh, that's an engineering challenge. So the biology <laughs> side works really well, but uh, there's very good results from many, many rodent models. And I pre I would think that primate models are also already tested. So it's moving forward very fast. Nice. So better resolution, better output. Yeah, multiple channels. So as yeah, many yeah. you know, we, we exactly. are working with very limited amount of channels. Yeah, in yeah exactly. So so this gene therapy, is it? did it come before we discovered CRISPR or after or...? How does this work? Because I was thinking CRISPR immediately when, when Charlotte mentioned it, but I wasn't sure. So oh so so gene therapy has been used in in the lab for many, many years to bring in genes to cells. So so it's it's quite a standardized procedure to look at to to add certain proteins or like change the, the expression of, of genes. Um, but now like this more coupling to to therapies something that's happened like the past decade like many right. years a couple, couple of decades I but but it's a matter of getting uh, also like a certain high enough level of, of of this gene therapy to to the right place in mm -hmm. order for it to work so is so take the like the the optogenetics that you need enough of these light sensitive uh, proteins to be uh, 
to get to get in and also to be stable mm -hmm. uh, over time and and and, and etc. Um, I think that CRISPR has just made it much yeah. more precise. I mean, yeah. you could still in the old days, you could still transfer genes or uh, 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 fragments of DNA, but now you can transfer an exact, uh, completely exact piece of DNA. Yeah. Okay, but do you go? You still go locally with the syringe and apply it there locally, or is it like uh, everywhere? How does it work? I don't know, guys. I'm not a biologist. So. Yeah, so so for this uh, autofelin or also so, so some other, yeah, you inject, um, you you put 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 the syringe like really to the to the inner ear and put it into these fluid filled chambers. You cannot just put it in in in, in the box. No, 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 <laughs> or it. no. But it's oh, also yeah. used for epilepsy and like, yeah. so, many other diseases. What? These. Uh, yeah. But Charlotte, you showed a virus uh, that it was inside a virus carrier, right? Or... Yeah, yeah, but it, it, yeah, but you can also uh, the gene therapy can also be packed. You can also have them um, packed in in certain types of uh, na nanoparticles, uh, etc. De de depending on which uh, technology you're going for. The great thing about the viral gene ther therapy is that then. By selecting the right vi virus type and so on, you can really modify into which cells it goes. So, mm -hmm. of course, whenever we are doing gene therapy, we have to be pretty careful that the gene doesn't go into the wrong place. So yeah, with yeah. the viruses, we can get some kind of cell type specificity. And so that, that's that's very cool. And with maybe with the other delivery systems, it might be more challenging. So, for example, that's why viruses are currently used a lot to do this. Mm -hmm. But but viruses are neither perfect because they might generate an, an 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 immune response, meaning that in in five years you will have antibodies, and then you had one shot for for this. Or okay, th this is maybe something that that can be solved over the years. But yeah, again, more uh, <laughs> things cool. to work on. Nice. So last question because you're already running uh, an extra time. So if you if you guys have to put your money in uh, one type of therapy, uh, which one would it be at the moment and why? <laughs> the toughest question. Uh, you don't have to say anything if it's uh, if it's critical, but if you're uh, okay to respond, then you can say it. Ah, oh, that's a tough one because it, <laughs> it, it it's more like like if you. Wish thinking or the more pessimistic. Uh, I mean, as the scientist that you are, which one right now you 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 think would would be likely to have some positive uh, result uh, in in the near future, in the very far future, whatever, however yeah. you think. Hmm. Because I, there are so I, many. Yeah, there, there are so many. I, th I think it's it's difficult also from to where I would put my, maybe I would start putting my money on some of these uh, oxidative stress molecules that, that are like very briefly doing some dam damage control that you have seen, like some drugs that you've taken from other conditions that, that you know that the, the mechanism that's sort of the, maybe the, the lowest hanging fruit, but, but, but I really think that the gene therapy at some point is, is gonna be a, a very good way to deliver certain things uh, very targeted rather than like proteins that that's very tricky and then e everyone says uh, stem cells because uh, that's uh, also just super cool that, that why not correct uh, that but, but there, there's uh, it's a bit further ahead yeah. i think i would something agree that charlotte with you mentioned protection. was the oh, sorry jacob you can go first of course. i think i would agree with you on protection i think that's a uh... That was probably the most uh, low-hanging fruit. Of course, there would be a lot of money in in aging, <laughs> uh, but but uh, I I think it's it's further ahead than doing the protection stuff. Yeah, there's so many things going wrong in yeah. in in aging, yeah. like where to start yeah. fixing in the car. Yeah, exactly so. I do agree that something with a bit protection, like Charlotte already mentioned, and for example, the cochlear implant during the implantation just protecting the resi residual hearing that's so important so and then we think about viral delivery for gene therapy for the inner ear we should also protect that one because we are also accessing the uh, the areas in that way so 
basically we kind of need protection in whatever we will do. So, so in a way, I think that's the first one and then the cool uh, other things will follow up maybe. I guess in an ideal world, if we can regenerate how much we want, then we don't need to protect it, right? I mean, <laughs> but, uh, it would be a lot cheaper and easier to to protect <laughs> rather than wait and. Damage. I mean, I mean, but if you don't have a choice and you're already damaged, but then you just keep. I don't know. It's just. Uh, but yes, of course, it's better to 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 not go there to begin with. Uh, yeah, that's a question. There's a question yeah. from Darken. I can see. Oh yeah. Some years ago, I read that the U.S. military did found a method to protect protect their soldiers even before combat. Uh, don't remember if it was medical, but apparently it only worked as protection for a limited number of hours, hmm. 18 hours or so. And was that only a good story for the newspapers, or is it <laughs> <laughs> great? That's for you, Charlotte. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard about that specifically, other than no. ear earplugs uh, <laughs> or some, something that can just really yeah, I, I get I it. Also, and that's the I think, the yeah. I think I'll use effective hearing, hearing uh, yeah. protectors. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe in some time, like we will every morning take our vitamin pill for, for the ear. Like who uh, who knows? Yeah, the disco pill, that's what we need. Oh, yes. We have, yeah. uh, <laughs> it was a drug, I believe, and not earplugs. OK. Well, we're just not informed, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's been a while, right? It was a few years ago. So we'll look into it. Perfect. All right, guys, this has been super, super interesting and uh, also very different from the usual. So I really appreciate it. I'm sure that community really appreciates Thanks for this. It, Absolutely. My pleasure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll keep talking and uh, yes. maybe at some point when we discover something new, you guys will come in again. <laughs> Uh, sure. Meanwhile, keep at it and uh, good luck. Okay. All right. Have Thanks a, a lot. Yeah. yeah. Have a Thanks good day. A See you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Likewise.